Hi, I'm Nick Maselli. At TD Bank, we believe all citizens need to be informed about the important financial issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. Fedway Associates. Verizon. TD Bank. Johnson & Johnson, the Russell Berry Foundation, and by the New Jersey Education Association. Promotional support provided by Insider NJ, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got that? this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome one-on-one. -on -one. I'm Steve Adubato. It's our honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Alan Sanders, who is Associate Professor of Political Science, St. Peter's University, and former Time Magazine senior reporter. Good to see you. My pleasure. Politics Today, 2017, about halfway through the year, will be seen after that as well. How would you describe the state of our nation in terms of the political divide? Complicated question. Well, yeah, I mean, the simple answer is highly polarized. Uh, the left doesn't trust the right. The right doesn't trust the left. Uh, the center is uh, uh, delicate, in some ways crumbling. And uh, we're in a serious uh, polarized uh, environment right now. So we're doing this, and, and let's just say the Trump administration has provided a whole range of interesting things to talk about. We're doing this uh, literally on the same day that James Comey is testifying. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone's talking about it, but this will again be seen after. What impact has Donald Trump had on the political slash media environment in this country? Well, he certainly put the media on the defensive, and uh, he has uh, uh, put the media in a situation uh, where it has to prove its trust. And that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, t uh, the uh, media uh, environment is difficult. It's always difficult because you're always dealing with politicians who are busy spinning. What or makes not it worse now? And this expression, fake news, wasn't around until recently. Well, what makes it work is the direct attack. It's very similar, of course, if you'll recall. Is it Nixonian? Uh, Nixon? Yeah, very much so. Remember um, uh, uh, Spiro Agnew the and his attack on the media? Bob's Absolutely. Of a negative. Right? right. And now it's called fake news. But we had the same, we had the same approach, the same attack, and the same uh, very similar environment back uh, during the Nixon years. Sure. American public. Do you think, uh, that's not a monolithic entity, but do you think most Americans are looking for those, those of us in the media? Because we often get accused of this. Even though at PBS, we don't have a point of view. We're not like MSNBC, Fox, CNN, others who have commentators on the air, anchors on the air expressing mm -hmm. points of view. But I'm curious about this. Do you think most Americans are looking for those in the media to press those in office and ask challenging questions, even if that person happens to have voted for and liked that person? Meaning. Are you for Trump or are you against Trump as opposed to, no, we're asking the president tough questions? Well, I think there are two, there are two components to the American public mind. One, one is you want tough questions. You want the politicians to answer those tough questions. And if you don't questions. get a straight answer, and do they want us to follow up or are we just being difficult? No, I think they want you to follow up. I mean, we've had the episodes of the various town meetings where the voters themselves have asked tough questions of the politicians. At the same time, we all want our own opinions reconfirmed. And so it's, it's, it's sort of a dichotomy. If you find a news media outlet or a news report that doesn't confirm your opinion, you tend to be a little skeptical. On the other hand, we also want reporters um, to ask tough questions, as we would want to ask tough questions to citizens. We've seen that, again, in the town hall meetings. So it's so interesting as you talk about this, because there are a whole bunch of folks who only watch MSNBC because that is where they believe they belong ideologically. They will not watch Fox. They may watch CNN. And there are many who watch Fox News. And, and what's fascinating to me, because they have their views reconfirmed, what's the danger of that? Well, it's called narrow casting, and the great danger is that it reinforces your own world. You shut out uh, contrary opinions, and therefore your worldview becomes distorted. In the old days, as you well know, we had just basically three television networks uh, and um, a relatively smaller number of newspapers or national newspapers, and so you were forced to flip through everything. 
stuff that you agreed with as well as stuff that you disagreed with. Today, you can call it uh, my, my daily, you know, my daily news and, mm -hmm. and only get that with which you agree. And that's always dangerous. You really have to uh, be exposed to contrary points of view so that you can inform an, an, you can form an informed judgment. The other piece is when you sign on board at time, the internet was not the internet. Social media was not, you know, the social media we know. What impact do you believe that the internet slash social media has had on the way we consume information and our overall attitude toward politics? I think it's had a negative impact. I'll tell you. Uh, negative. Negative. Absolutely. I tell you something that I was told when I first uh, uh, signed on to work with uh, the internet uh, element of Time Magazine. I was told, make sure that whatever you want to say, the most important things that you want to say fit a TV screen, because people may not scroll down below that. So whatever you want to say, make it quick, make it short, make it um, interesting, right within the framework, the first framework of, of, the, of, of the screen. And really, if you really want to be an informed person, you've got to go below the screen. You've got to look deeper. at things much deeper, absolutely. By the way, is this what you teach at St. Peter's? I teach mass media, and the, sure, and I tell them, absolutely, take a look at things much more deeply, read widely. I, I'm a, a tough professor that insists that my students read, because that's really where you're going to get uh, the real information. Question about, it's interesting how you're talking about media, how we get information. The monetizing of news, what does that mean? The monetizing, meaning yeah. money? Yeah, like I gotta, if we're not sure. making money with it, it can't be good. Sure. Well, that, that's the problem. I mean, understand that most of the media in the United States is privatized. So that's good because it's well, not under the sun. you got us. But you also are getting funding from private corporations. The, the, we the, sure do. We just so, close all that right up on front on the right. air. Do so, you have a problem with that? No, but, but it, creates a, it creates a problem. This is, this is the problem. The good news is, of course, that you're not depending on government funding. So, of course, you can be independent. But the bad news is you're always searching for an audience. And to do that, uh, for many networks, for many news outlets, you're dealing with something called infotainment. You have to mix information together with an entertainment component. You've got to draw the readers in. You've got to draw the viewers or the listeners in. And so it needs to be a balanced approach. Some professional outfits do that, others don't. They focus more on the attainment than on the info. Yeah, but if politics is seen as largely quote unquote entertainment, and some might argue that Donald Trump was very entertaining during the campaign in 2016, fair mm -hmm. to say? Sure. What impact does that have for the future for candidates who know how to be quote, entertaining in an election, we got these serious issues. Well, entertaining, of course, always depends on context. So Donald Trump can be entertaining by being different in the way that he's different. The or next say outrageous of, things. Right. The next set of candidates can be entertaining by being entirely different. Explain that. Well, by being, by being uh, reasonable, by making a reasonable argument, by being, uh, using sound bites to actually say uh, what actually is truthful. Uh, Don Donald Trump has told us that he engages in truthful hyperbole. I mean, that's on record. Truthful his, hyperbole. Yeah, that's in his so book. So because he exaggerates and because he embellishes, mm -hmm. but he thinks that's, he says it's a more interesting story. But it might be a, a less accurate story. It might make for a good business deal. But does it make for good diplomatic relations? Does it make for good relations with Congress? Let me ask you this one. I mean, I don't know if this happens at, at your university um, or in your private life. Is it my imagination or that is it fair to say that more and more Americans have a harder time talking to other Americans, whether they be friends, family, and others, about anything political because of how polarized we are? There are some friends who voted differently than I voted in the presidential election. I respect their point of view. But my God, the conversations I got into, into with them were heated, and I didn't want it to be that way. It was personal. It was... Am I making too much of this? No, I, don't. I think you're not. I've heard that from many people, that the political conversations are more difficult, in part because of the climate uh, that uh, Donald Trump has created. Well, it's not on him. Let's be, it, it, because he, he created that environment? He exploited it. He's, he's accused people of being uh, all kinds of things, and he didn't he create it, but he has exploited it and taken it to new and exaggerated heights, sure. Now, he's not the only politician who does that, but he's the president of the United States. And when he tweets exaggerated statements, that gets people's attention, and it creates a climate, a climate that only the president can create. No senator, no governor, no mayor uh, has the same loud speaker uh, uh, to express opinions and to create a climate. Mm -hmm. president is responsible not just for the policies that he makes, but also for for the political climate that he creates. And President uh, uh, Trump has created a very aggressive and a very polarized climate. Real quick, last question. How hopeful are you that we can go 
in a better, healthier direction in this country when it comes to the political discourse? I'm very hopeful because we have a system of checks and balances. And we've been through crises before. We've gotten through them. They've always been difficult, but we've always emerged a more successful and stronger country. Professor Alan Sanders, uh, a retired lawyer, um, associate professor of political science at St. Peter's University, also a former Time Magazine senior reporter. I want to thank you so much, Alan, for joining us on this most important topic that affects every American. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Stay right there. Thank you. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you. Thank you. To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We are honored to be joined by Dr. Stephen Brower, medical director, Left Court Family Cancer Treatment and Wellness Center, and Patricia Mazzola, who is Advanced Practice Genetics Nurse, Englewood Hospital Medical Center. Good to see both of you. Good to see Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Are you ready for this? Yeah. I think it was two and a half years ago, I'm on a tour with Warren Geller, right, your CEO, of this facility that you're going to have. This is it. I was walking through. I saw concrete. I saw, what are they going to have here? This is it. Describe what it is. Well, if you're walking there today, Steve, you'd see thousands of patients. And you'd see patients every day um, being in an incredibly beautiful, compassionate center where we bring together all this expertise under one roof. Mm. So patients are not moving around from doctor to doctor, from expert to expert. They're within one group. And uh, we're trying to make their odyssey through this whole cancer experience, you know, so much more sensitive. And personal. I mean, that's the other part of it that's fascinating to me. So personalized medicine, quote, tumors are not all the same. Correct. What does that mean? Well, I just want to do a little bit about personalized versus precisional, precision medicine. So years ago, we used to say personalized medicine, and people thought, well, they're directing it towards that particular person. Now it's really talking about the effectiveness of treatment, how we treat the cancers, and taking the whole person in context of what their so disease is. genetics as well? Certainly What's genetics What's the connection between genetics? Huge. Okay, you're, you're diagnosed with a particular form of cancer. Your genetics, your genetic testing that you do. What does that have to do with how you treat the patient? A lot. It has a lot to do, and it gets more and more all the time. So we're looking at um, if you were diagnosed with breast cancer. Right. So we're looking at your family history, your personal history, the type of tumor that you have, the biomarkers, and Dr. Brown will talk more about the Jump in there, markers. because the, all, those all those factors matter, those variables matter, in the protocol. Mm -hmm. So let's peel it away for, sure. peel it back for a second, Steve. You know, when I entered into cancer treatment 30 years ago, I would never have dreamed that we could examine the proteins and the DNA within a cell to more precisely define for each patient prevention, perhaps, treatment and therapy, and then survivorship as you're living and being treated, how we can make it better for that patient. And now today, this precision medicine means we look at the precise abnormalities within that patient's tumor mm. and then turn that into a formula for personalized medicine. So like over the past year, mm. we've introduced 20, 30 new drugs to treat patients that are just based on these abnormalities that we're finding in the, in the cell. But, but in, so let me ask you a follow up on that. In terms of radiation, chemotherapy, can you be more targeted in how you go at it as opposed to treating the whole body? Absolutely. In fact, there are some tests that we do, oncotype, um, tumor suppressor genes, to actually identify whether a person needs chemotherapy or not. It used to be 25 years ago, if you were diagnosed with breast cancer, this is the treatment. And for everyone. For everyone. There was very little discussion and leeway. Now, each time a patient is diagnosed, we talk about different things that may affect not only how they're treated, but the outcomes and, and everything that's included in you know, managing a patient. Well, Steve, I, I want to tell you sure. two exciting things that when you and I first were even walking around our cancer center a year and a half, two years ago, didn't even exist. Number one, it used to be thought of surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy. That's the protocol. Now, that was the protocol. That was the protocol. Now, today, 
After a hundred years of slow incremental progress, we now talk of a new player, and that's the immune system. That's how you or I, as the host, interact with the tumor. Interact with interact. the tumor? Interact, exactly. The cells of the immune system recognize this tumor is foreign. And now we have new medications that can boost it, that can help the immune system to really hone in on these tumors. So that now, mm -hmm. when we think about treatment, as I said, we've introduced 20 more medications that weren't even available to patients. And the, the, the most important thing is they're to treat tumors that were the hardest ones to treat Such recently. As? Lung cancer, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, head and neck cancer. More reason to be hopeful? Much more reason you to be yes hopeful. You say yes as well. Oh, for sure. There's so much more reason to be hopeful that the, some of the worst prognostic cancers are being treated with all these innovative treatments, these targeted treatments, and they're doing really well. So, so this genetic testing, is it for everyone? Yes, it is for everyone. Um, it's an interesting question because initially we used you know, to Because you excuse me for interrupting, you know a lot of people say, no, not me, you say. I say yes, it's because it's not, all genetic testing isn't for everyone. And that the importance of counseling that person as to the implications for that testing, not only for them, but for their family. So, yes, it is for everyone to know about. Is it private? Does it stay yes. private? You're both shaking your head. Yes. There's totally a, confidential here, right? right? There's a, actually the Gene Act, which is the Genetic Information Act that prevents anybody from knowing what your genetic um, makeup is. So, so Steve, cancer genetics and... Pat is the expert on this. You know, have initiated and been around now for 10 years, I guess, with mm. breast cancer and the tremendous. Yeah. So we've learned a lot about uh, confidentiality. That's right. Uh, what it means when you have to tell not only the patient, but their family this news. And that's why we, not only within our cancer center and with all the important cancer centers, not only have the people doing radiation therapy, surgery, chemotherapy, we have these experts as well. And by the way, you're only one of 56 nurses with your area of expertise? Right, in, in, the, in, the, in country, the country. In the country. There's three actually in Englewood. Is, we, is that right? We, we, we really made a push for that. But it's interesting that you said we actually Half have- minute left, go ahead. A cancer risk assessment and genetics counseling program. It's not a genetics program. It's actually a cancer risk assessment. So it's people to come from all, anywhere, all over, to really evaluate their cancer risk. You know, people talk about cancer prevention, and I don't know how much prevention we can do, but we can certainly find out more how to live healthier lives. A few seconds left. Reason to be hopeful is? So first of all, by the numbers, Steve. A decade ago, maybe one or two patients who had cancer lived more than five years. Today, more than two of three, two-thirds of the patients are alive after the five years. So that's great, great news and hope. The other piece is we're finding new ways to look at these genetics. So hopefully, in the not-too-distant future, you can actually take a sample of blood and look at the abnormalities mm. that a patient's tumor may have without these invasive biopsies. So a lot of things coming Reason along. to be hopeful, but much more research. Um, and we want to thank you for joining us. Make sure you come back and give us uh, the update in about a year or so. We appreciate it. Thank Good you. stuff for going on at your place. Okay. Thank you. One on one, one on two right now. Be right back right after this. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Everything you've ever wanted or needed to know about wine, you're going to find out right now. Gary Fish, owner, CEO, Gary's Wine and Marketplace. Uh, found it when? 1987, 30 years ago. Get out of here. How, how did you know back then, back in the day, 30 years ago, wine is the thing? How did you know? I, you know, I saw it happening. I fell in love with wine when I was 22, 23. Nobody was drinking wine. I'm like, it's coming. It's, it's a, you travel to Italy, France, 
everybody drinks wine with a meal. It's happening. It's coming to New Jersey. And when the opportunity came to open the store in 87, I said, we're going to be a fine wine shop in New Jersey. But you're a very successful salesman for a company we know well, our friends at Fedway, Fedway. right? Sure. Um, Richard, Neil, Rob, that whole yeah. crew, right? So uh, you said, I want to go out on my own. How yeah. scary was that? It was, it was terrifying. You know, I was married uh, nine years, eight years, 29 years old, so six years. And I was doing great at Fedway, and I loved it. But when the opportunity came to run my own business and to grow myself, I said I had to do it. There was no question in my mind that that was a direction for me. They walk into one of your stores with the experience. The experience is comfort. We treat every customer that walks in as a guest, as a friend of the family. You come to us, we don't sell you wine. We have a conversation about what you want. What are you having for dinner? What do you like? What don't you like? And then through conversation, we figure out what is the best beverage for you, whether it's a spirit or wine or beer. It doesn't matter to us. It's about making you happy. How do you train your people to do that? Because that's not just selling. It's something more complicated than that. You know, we or joke. Different. Maybe not well, more we joke because we, we try to hire people that have passion for wine and selling, and then we taste so much wine. We drink so much bad wine, so you don't have to. That's really you, you what we get, do. That, that's how you get to what you want and need. We, we, a, it allows us to taste an enormous amount of wine. B, it allows us to, to filter, right? There's thousands of wines coming at us every day. And what we do is we say, yes, no, yes, no. Our wine team is tasting along with us. So then when the guests come in the store, mm. they've tasted a lot of wine, so they have an experience and a feel for what we like so they can hand it off and pass it on to our guests. But you also do a lot of traveling to find out Chile experience, wine, go ahead. Oh my God, January, I had the opportunity to go to Chile. And I brought my wife, so that was an extra bonus. I just figured I'll throw that in there, you know, make her feel That'll good. That'll work, we're looking right now at you, go ahead. And what happens there in Chile? So Chile, they, they brought all the winemakers to Patagonia. So Chile is a long country, and as the Chilean people taught me, to know Chile is to love Chile. And it's such a diverse community of grower, grow, a, a diverse community of growing regions, and people, and food styles, and wine styles, that they brought all the winemakers together in Patagonia. So every morning we would get up at nine o'clock, get up early, nine o'clock we taste 32 wines, and then we go for a hike. Then we'd have lunch and taste 20 different wines. Then we'd get on a boat and do a tour and taste 15 experimental wines. And then we'd have a food and wine pairing for dinner. So over a course of a week, we tasted hundreds of wines right there with the winemakers on, mm. on spot. And so we got to share and bond and talk to them. But, but, Great experience. But, but, but Susie, for interrupting her, but then what happens is you bring some of that wine back. Well, what I do is we come back now and I am fired up and jazzed about Chilean wines. So first thing I said to the wine teams is we have to make room. We had about 30 Chilean wines, we brought in 50 new wines. But because I was enamored and I was in love, we retasted about 90 wines. And from that, we pared it down to about 45, 50 new Chilean wines we brought in. That's awesome. By the way, the charity work, uh, I want to plug Grand Tasting event. What is it and why does it matter? Because it makes a difference for people. It makes a huge difference. First, we've been doing it for about 28 years now. What is it? It's our Grand Tasting. So every year, we, we round up about 70 wine vendors, including our friends at Fedway. Right. Um, all major wholesalers are involved. A lot of vineyards from Napa Valley and uh, Italy come and bring some great wines for our guests to taste. We then donate all the money back to charity. All the money? All the money back to charity. We make no money on it. We, we, all the expenses the store generates, and we, we've donated to Marstown Hospital, Memorial Hospital for years, uh, Interfaith Food Pantry. Uh, we've done some big brothers and big sisters. Uh, and, you know, and we mm -hmm. do the community theater in Marstown. Great stuff. Uh, so we do a lot. We try to balance it between the hospital and the care and the need and the culture of the arts because they clearly don't get enough money. Getting your name out there, getting the brand out there. I mean, you do you actually do spots and connect it with us. But you also, you actually tell me the spot you've had, you've had for a couple of years. It's a strong spot. But here's the question. Is that the way you market and brand and advertise or is it word of mouth or both? It's it's. Both, you know, I, for us it's about word of mouth. It's about people having a great experience in the store and then telling their friends about their great experience. And that to me is the most important. And that's also, you know, we talked about the grand tasting. It's also for me now about giving back to the community. That I feel if I'm out there and we're donating money and we're helping, you know, I was just, did, I was the MC at New Jersey Battered Women. 
We I, just had those people in here in the Morris County. They're extraordinary people. Extraordinary people. I've, I've fallen in love with what they do and how they do it. And we raised about $170,000 in seven minutes. What? Seven minutes. I had to hug everybody that donated it's money. It's all good. It was all good for seven minutes. Some people offered to donate more if I didn't hug them. <laughs> but that's another but what discussion. what a great cause. But it's a great cause. I'm on the board of the YMCA in Madison. We love those folks. The YMCA teaches more people how to swim than any other organization. I was just uh, joined the board of the Community Foundation. What a great Jersey. organization Hans up there. Hans is fantastic. They help Newark. So, so part of what I'm doing is I'm trying to reach out and not just help the business, but help the community that has helped us. Gary's Wines and Marketplace. Gary Fish is the CEO, president, 30 years in it, uh, as young as ever, doing good things. And most importantly, beyond your operation business-wise, you're giving back to a lot of people. Thank we you, sure Gary. try. Steve, Appreciate thanks for having party. me. And by the way, let's talk governor. One-on-one <laughs> <laughs> -on -one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One-on-One -on -one with Steve Adubato has been provided by Choose New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Verizon, TD Bank, Johnson & Johnson, the Russell Berry Foundation, and by the New Jersey Education Association. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. As an educator, it's all about connections. You're not just in the classroom, you're part of the community. You meet these tiny kids every year, and you help them learn and grow. But you also get to know the families, and over the years, they become a part of your life, and you become a part of theirs. When you build those connections, you can accomplish some pretty amazing things. I'm Jackie Kruzik, and I'm proud to be a New Jersey educator.